Let's get a look at the bigger picture. George Schulte is with us, founder of Schulte Asset Management. Some of your thoughts on the market right now. Hi, Nicole. Good to see you. Uh, so we've had a lot of volatility. I mean, it's early in uh, June when we last uh, spoke, when I was down on the exchange with you uh, last month. I said, sell in May and go away. Well, May was a pretty volatile month. Um, you know, now we're starting to see a continuing uncertainty about what's going to happen with the labor market and interest rates. And, of course, uh, inflation continues to, uh, you know, be trending here. Yesterday we had the big, uh, you know, the big uh, uh, trade settlement issue uh, with uh, some software problems on one of the exchanges. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty, you know, a lot of macroeconomic data coming through this week, mostly with labor. Um, you'll see the DOL uh, report uh, uh, the May jobs, you know, later in, uh, on, on Friday this week. And, and uh, you know, right now, you know, it looks like there's a lot of continuing uncertainty. People don't know if the Fed's going to lower rates or could keep them higher. You know, for now, my bet is that they'll probably keep them higher. You still have an inverted yield curve, which is forecasting risk of future recession later this year or maybe early in 2025. And certainly the equity markets have been on quite a run up until now. So I think what we're doing is we're setting up for really, really a once in a lifetime opportunity for investing in distressed securities going forward with higher interest rates, with inflation, with secular change. And so I think that really sets up for an exciting future uh, for, for that strategy going forward. Yeah. You know, um, and we will start with Friday's jobs report. It could go either way. And then you have the Fed meeting next week, right? What do you think is the most likely scenarios that we will see? I think the Fed is likely to punt again. I mean, you might see some additional guidance about where they might go, uh, but I think they're likely to just leave rates where they are for now. Um, and then maybe in November, there's some action if, if you get a bit of a sell-off or you know some systemic issues coming through. I think that a lot of the, the, the issues you've had up until now in the market with much higher interest rates affecting most borrowers, including highly levered borrowers, is still you know, reason for concern. And the banks, the regional banks, I think you still have lots of reason for concern as well. Many of them still have unrealized losses on their balance sheet and this big change with commercial real estate where there's less and less demand. Um, and, and, you know, that secular change because of the trend for, of more people working from home means that the value of a lot of commercial real estate office space is just lower and banks may have trouble digesting that on their balance sheets. Uh, so we'll see, you know, that could, because that could create systemic risk to the system overall. Um, but I think yeah. for now, the Fed is not gonna do anything. What's your interpretation? And I just had a great conversation with Kevin Hanks because um, we noted together that there was progress made and that there were fewer job openings. You, you know, you presume that those are filled and so that number comes down. At the same time, the other side of the coin is the economy. And sometimes when the economy starts to slow, companies just list fewer jobs. So right now, the jolts number fell to a three year low to the 2021 levels. And we're at 1.2 available jobs for every job seeker. Had been two jobs for every job seeker. So you get my point. Um, how do you interpret when this JOLTS number is coming down? Well, it's certainly showing a trend. Um, but I think the important high level concept here is that the unemployment rate is still quite low at 3.9%. Uh, that's at sort of close to record levels. And inflation is still higher than the Fed's target, which is 2%. You know, whether you, you measure it via CPI or the, or the you know, PCE price uh, deflator, you know, you're well above the Fed's target still. And so the Fed, I think, is unlikely to suddenly drop interest rates. You know, we're probably getting close to the tail end of their hiking cycle, uh, but the bigger concern there is that rates came from 0% previously. You know, 24 months ago, rates were effectively zero, and now, you know, the short term policy rate is above 5%. So that's a, just a dramatic change. Right. And that impact on most borrowers is significant. Right. So you're more in the camp of it's more progress when those numbers were coming down versus um, concerns about a slowing economy. Um, tell me about Vistra. That's your name, your stock pick, right? VST? Yes, yes. We like this utility. This utility restructured its ticker VST. It restructured a couple of years back in 2016, 
in that plan, it eliminated over $30 billion in debt. And before that, it had been the biggest independent power company leveraged buyout. Uh, it was formerly called TXU, and then you know, briefly it was called Energy Future Holdings before rebranding as Vistra. Along the way, this company also bought Dynegy, one of its big competitors. Um, it achieved big synergies from acquiring Dynegy. And then earlier this year, in the first quarter, Vistra closed on the purchase of Energy Harbor, which created one of the largest zero carbon carbon generating and retail platforms in the United States with six, six excuse me, 6,400 total megawatts of power generation. Now, this company is clearly benefiting from increasing demand for electricity due to AI data centers, electric vehicle uh, charging, and new economy manufacturing. Also, it stands to benefit quite nicely, we think, from the Inflation Reduction Act, which created tax incentives for utilities like this one with respect to renewable storage, hydrogen, and nuclear. Um, by the way, the company also repurchased almost 30% of its shares outstanding since Texas Storm Uri from a few years ago. So it currently trades at about $88 a share, but we think Vistra is worth at least $135 a share because of the trends I just described. Yeah, understood. And, uh, you know, in the utility sector, a more of a um, defensive play, people have been liking that group very much. I mean, what do you do when people have FOMO or they ask you about the MAG-7, for example, George? You know, I think I think you get enough exposure to the MAG-7 through just ETFs. And I think most investors, whether or not they know it, I think they're probably a little bit overexposed to the MAG-7. So with Vistra, here's a play that's you know, a little bit more conservative. In fact, the company has hedged most of their future production for the next several years, as well as our costs. Um, and so you have some pretty interesting upside with, with the themes that I just spoke about. Um, in terms of the overall market, I would ex exercise some caution because, you know, no stocks grow to the moon, but lots of ETFs have been driving up the price for, for the MAG-7, and I think that, uh, you know, that, that theme has, has largely played out by, by this point. Great to see you. George Schulte, thank you so much at Schulte Asset. You as well, Nicole. Thank you.